All right, and we are live. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nate Birkbeck here with my guest today, David Heinemeyer Hansen, a man who, at least for this audience, I think uh, does not need any uh, introduction. Thanks for uh, coming on and agreeing to do this, David. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Um, so for anyone just tuning in, um, just to give some context, this interview is one of six that I'm conducting for the complete guide to Rails performance. Um, while this one is public uh, for obvious reasons, uh, the other five are only available for purchasers of the complete guide, This, which is this course that I wrote on the uh, performance for Rails applications. So you can check out those other interviews by going to railspeed.com. Um, it's with people like Mike Parham of Sidekick, Sean Griffin, uh, the Active Record Maintainer, and uh, lots of other cool people. So it's railspeed.com. All right. So, um, where do you start with, like, you know, the person that wrote the framework? Um, I, I think I'll start with, uh, so let's talk about Basecamp. One of the things, or one of the stories, I guess, that I sort of, like, end up telling when people ask me about Rails performance is, or I guess performance in their applications is something I heard from you guys. Um, which was like this retelling of something that Jeff Bezos said to you, uh, which is that no one will wake up 10 years from now and wish that their app was slower. Um, and you said previously that, you know, speed is a feature. And then, so I'm wondering like, how do you enforce that at Basecamp? Like what, how is that, you know, speed is a feature, like how does that live out in, in your organization? Like are people filing like bug reports when they think something is too slow? Is there like, uh, you know, a, a bar where it's like, okay, anything slower than 100 milliseconds on production, like we're filing that in the bug pile. Like, how does that get get borne out at Basecamp? So I think it's really two parts. First is having it at the forefront when you start developing how you set everything up. And for us, that's been a number of things. Uh, the Russian doll caching strategy is probably the most important in terms of server-side performance. We've used that strategy since uh, the last new version of Basecamp in like 2012, when we, um, when I really started getting more sort of militant about having fast page responses. And that was a lot about um, just making sure that every page change felt good and fast and felt modern. Um, when we introduced a new version of Basecamp in 2012, there was definitely a, a shift, right? Like the earlier version was from 2003, and we'd patched it mm. and extended it and so on, but it was born in a, in a different era where just like, hey, you could have 600 millisecond uh, server render times, and that was not a, a big deal. And then in 2012, you just couldn't. It just was not going to feel like a good modern app if if you still did that. So. That's when we came up with a lot of the caching strategies. And, and Russian doll, for those who don't know, it's is basically caching inside of caching and expiring things uh, as little as possible. So said if you have a whole page, it might consist of 50 different caches. You change one element of that thing, and you might expire five of those caches, thus still reusing 55 of them. Um, and that strategy then got us down to that magic number of around 100 milliseconds with Rails. Because, I mean, there's no bones about it. Ruby and Rails uh, is not, without caching, going to get you to 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds or even 100 milliseconds if you do sufficiently complicated things. And if you think of, of something like a base camp page, some of the pages we have literally have thousands of data points. Like, thousands of little bits of information in it. As in, if you run this entire page with no caching at all, I did that um, on a page a while back and I saw 850 SQL queries. And which is, in, it sounds crazy, right? But it's also part of a deliberate strategy. And one of the deliberate strategies are that things like n plus one is a feature, which usually is seen as a bug, right? Like if you have an That's n plus really one. That's really interesting. Um, if you have an n plus one, Query, it means you're, you're executing one SQL query per element. So if you have five block or 50 um, uh, emails in an inbox or something, that'd be 50 SQL calls, right? That sounds like a bug. Well, in a Russian caching doll setup, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Because the beauty of those individual calls are that they're individually cached, 
on their own timeline and that they're super simple because the whole way you get around doing n plus one is you do joins you do more complicated queries that take longer to compute and tax the database harder if you can simplify those queries such that they're stupid simple but there's just more of them well you win if and only if you have a caching strategy that can support that right so for example if you say you, you have this inbox it has 50 items in it the very first time no well not even the very first time you could you can imagine like oh the first time you rendered that that would trigger 50 calls no it wouldn't the first time you rendered that that would trigger one call because there would only be one element in it like this is part of having this long-term view of how the caches work and when they expire because if you're slowly building up this cache that in the end you will get to 50 uh, emails in that inbox um, yes if you blew away all the caches at that point you would take the 50 hit but you were building it incrementally so every time someone saw that page you were only executing one additional query or two additional queries because you were only doing one at a time that is um i used the inbox example but an even better example is chat in basecamp um we have n plus one up the wasu for chat like if you load the uh chat page in basecamp three cold it's going to trigger i don't know hundreds of sql queries right because it never does because these caches are built incrementally so that you never pay the full tax at least the user never gets to see the the full brunt of that and if they do if you did have to blow them away okay whatever that one time okay the page took 1.5 seconds to render because if you're using a, a russian doll caching strategy with a you know, uh, an approach of also saying, well, I'm only going to do one SQL query per controller, which is going to be this big thing that's got, you know, joining three or four tables and including yes. five or six models, right? You're, you're incurring that cost every time, exactly. no matter how many caches are warm. Exactly. That's really interesting. I honestly hadn't thought of that. That before. is the big revelation, I'd say, of the approach that we're using. And it's also one of the things that makes me chuckle when I then see people go like, oh, it's really a problem that Rails doesn't equally execute your SQL queries, just that it, they're eagerly executed in the um, controller, just that I can see where they are. What are you talking about? I don't want to execute any SQL queries that are going to be caught by a Russian doll cache, right? And a lot of these queries you set up, Sometimes they will never be executed. I have queries I set up in, in controllers in Basecamp all the time that I expect won't run. They're set up as delayed, lazy execution that will only run if certain things are expired. Um, so for example, if you take um, a standard Basecamp thing and you say you go to the messages index or something like that, um, those messages will all bubble up their expiration to the project. So they will all, if a new message comes in, it'll touch the project, right? So the project is the key root um, expiration point. If the project is expired, like let's reload the page. This is a simple example, and there are some other considerations to take into effect. But the point I want to make is that if that project did not change, well, I don't want to execute select all from messages where project ID equals five. I want to delay that as long as possible so that there's a good chance it'll be caught inside one of the Russian dolls and thus never executed. So this is where Rails um, supports a lot of things from a lot of different angles. And this is where if you look at these things in isolation and you just look at, oh, why is Rails not lazy executing queries um, such that I can't see the performance time in the controller, you're missing the point a little bit. Like, you're missing the point of why we're doing that, right? You also can, right? So. That's the other part I find funny is uh, some of these criticism. Like you just add dot load. <laughs> if you want to get frivolous execution, then just add dot load to everything, and it'll execute <laughs> right where you declare it uh, or you run it. Right. Anyway, to get back to the point, I'm I'm kind of duck deep down to uh, some very uh, minutia uh, of this uh, performance at Basecamp and how we enforce it. This is how we enforce it. We try to think about it from all the angles, uh, and then we try to bake it into sort of an architecture that's supported by multiple pillars, such that we can rely on using Rails and Ruby for things that have a 1,000 data points, design pages in that way, and still get below 100 milliseconds. Because the other thing about performance, which I've come to realize, is that there's <clears throat> performance and then there's good enough. Like, I see a lot of... Uh, um hello world benchmarks that are like oh i generate my hello world in like nanoseconds 
who gives a flying fuck? Have you ever met a customer who went like, oh yeah, your page renders in 100 milliseconds. That is so not good enough. I need nanoseconds. Like no one ever asked for that, right? So that is where the performance strategy is very much informed by the business goals that we have. We want to get to a point where users can't tell the difference between, and generally they cannot. Um, they cannot tell the difference between 100 milliseconds and one nanosecond. There's just too many other factors of the network and of the client side and all sorts of other things that these things will get swallowed, right? That brings me to the second point. So Basecamp 2, which was the 2012 model, focused a lot on server-side optimizations. This was where we went from having pages that perhaps took 400 milliseconds and then we got them down to 100 or 80 or something else like that through these caching strategies. And we thought, woohoo! And why did we think woohoo? Because that was what we were measuring, right? So we were measuring, oh man, we improved the performance of this page by 4x. Well, uh, again, user does not give a flying fuck how long it takes for you to generate things on the server side. What they care about is how long does it take from them clicking a button until they have the next page with all the information that they need. Well, that comes back to the point that the server side is one component of that, and important, but perhaps, well, not even perhaps, not the most important. The most important is the rest of your HTTP pipelining. The rest of your setup is your JavaScript, it's your CSS, it's your CDN setup, it's all those other things, right? And we weren't focusing on those as hard in 2012 as we were in this most recent version of Basecamp, Basecamp 3 that we just released because we weren't measuring it. And a lot of people aren't measuring that because it's a little harder. If you just set up uh, a Skylight or um, other performance measuring tools, they generally focus on the SERP side, which is great. Like that's easy to do. and. And, and you should do it because you should know. And, and if you get big spikes, you should do something about it. But it tells a very incomplete picture. And what we found, once we started measuring the, the client side, the full requests were that sometimes we'd have pages that took 100 milliseconds to generate on the server side, but it still took like one and a half seconds to make the full change. And why was that? Oh, because we injected some very inefficient jQuery plugin to do a fucking pull down menu somewhere that took like 200 milliseconds to initially uh, initialize right and you go like wait what i just spent how long to i put up this extravagant uh, architecture of russian doll caching to get to 100 milliseconds and then i blew twice that budget on a freaking jQuery plugin to do a pull down menu you got to be kidding me and we did not find this until we started measuring this. So Basecamp 3 today on um, staff use has a little um, tracker down in the corner that measures how long did this thing take from the full width of it. Not just the server side, but the full width of the request. All the initialization, all the JavaScript that needs to run, everything, right? And this was in part what also led us to really embrace TurboLinks because it was once we started seeing those changes, right? Like, I think that was part of the, the pushback and perhaps the misunderstanding of triple links in the early days. It was hard for people to, to measure it. So they thought, eh, probably doesn't matter because my server side time still looked the same. Why would I want the bother of triple links when it does have some, uh, often, funnily enough, incompatibilities with jQuery plugins, which in many ways actually turns out to be a feature, not a bug, because <laughs> it um, requires you to actually introspect those jQuery plugins and figure out what the hell they're doing, and in many cases realize that you could write in 100 lines of JavaScript what you just pulled in 4,000 lines of jQuery plugin for. So anyway, that's kind of a, an aside. The, the core notion was for us, I think a rough rule of thumb here, and I should have checked it before I quoted it, but I'm going to quote it anyway, was that let's say we do server side in 100 milliseconds. Then we can do the full request with turbo links in about 300. This is me on a particular line with a particular set of lag, blah, 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 disclaimers, disclaimers, disclaimers. And then if we did not have turbo links, it would take 900, 900 milliseconds for the same server side um, setup, right? And obviously, 900 milliseconds is on the other side of acceptable for feeling fast, modern, da 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 300 from full to full on a real connection from Spain, I think is where I did this, is very good and feels great. Um, so that's part of the passion that we had for, for Turbolinks and amongst other things of uh, pl uh, multi-platform development and native and blah, blah, blah. Um, mm -hmm.
Anyway, I should probably let you ask a question because I've been ranting for like 15 <laughs> minutes off uh, of one no. innocent provocation of how do you do performance? Well, it was a, it was a it was a broad question in, intended to, to provoke such a response. Okay. Um, so uh, I think people have already noticed you can a, uh, ask questions on the right hand side here, um, and I'm looking at those. And, and one of those that which is a question that I had as I was listening to that was, um, you're clearly you know when you you describe this like intentionally writing in N plus ones when you have a Russian doll uh, caching strategy, mm -hmm. uh, you're clearly making an assumption then about, uh, you know, in your back end, how long you're able to keep these caches warm, right? Like we're, we're sometimes yeah. often told as programmers, right? Like the cache is a good thing, but like we shouldn't assume that whenever we go to BEM cache, it's always going to be there, right? So yes. you're clearly you doing some you things shouldn't. in the back end that are like, you know, are that you're, you're doing more work, I think, than most people do to keep caches warm in the long term? Mm, there's not really that much intent behind it. I remember actually when we did the 2012 model, I posted a picture which became one of the most retweeted blog posts of that year, which was, uh, this is how much RAM you can buy for $10,000. And it had like modules lined up or something like that. So it, computers are so fucking cheap. RAM is ludicrously cheap. If you run a, real business, as in I define that as, as a thing that produces uh, money, <laughs> um, and you hire programmers at market rates, uh, most computing spends are rounding errors when it comes to applications of the kind that I built. So I, I've set up all the disclaimers here to make an irrefutable statement. Um, there's certainly there are like if you're trying to do WhatsApp or serve a billion people and basically charge them nothing or a dollar a year, yeah, okay, you have different concerns than I do, and that is wonderful, isn't it? That we can use different tools for different uh, purposes. I argue and I posit that Basecamp as an application archetype represents the vast, vast, vast majority of scale and performance throughput and so on that most applications in the world will ever see. Um, there is a small subset of applications that far exceed what we're doing at, at Basecamp. We're not doing internet scale or web scale, I suppose was the word. We're not doing web scale in the sense of what Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and so on needs to deal with. Do you know what else? Almost no one else is <laughs> either. Like it is such a power curve, power law of the people who need to deal with a billion users or even a hundred million users or even 10 million users, right? Like most people just don't need to deal with those problems. And when they try to be inspired by the tools, techniques and frameworks that are required to serve a billion users at a buck a year in a per performant and um, profitable way, they get led astray because those tools are not relevant and not suitable for the work that they're doing, which is why I'm so passionate about promoting Basecamp as an archetype in that I think it's a far broader spectrum and catches far more use cases. Thus, I believe that the tools that I'm building to enable me to build Basecamp is suitable for far more people. Yeah. And these techniques that we're using for performance in particular are suitable for far more people. So how do you deal with uh, a cold cache then? Like, do you have like a, a, a backup, you know, memcache instance setting some, sitting mm -hmm. around somewhere that like if, you know, one goes down, you, you know, like how do you avoid the completely cold cache scenario? Yeah, so we have multiple servers. Like, don't have a single point of failure on a single memcache. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, memcache, and I think we actually we're using Redis right now um, for, for the caching, that you can set those up in, in, in distributed and clusters and so on, it's just that any one machine that goes down is not a calamity. Um, but the funny thing I've also found is that things also move on in other ways. Like, if you do ever have to load that cold cache, um, things are a little slow. Like, we are over-provisioned, but not ludicrously so at all. And we can still deal with the fact that occasionally we can have uh, some elements of the cache fall out, and it's just not a problem. Um, and maybe these things weren't true in, like, 2005 or 2008 or whatever. I don't really care what 
was true in 2008. I care about what's true in 2016 for my business and my scope, right? And I think things are only moving in that direction, which is why I'm always so perplexed by performance discussions, especially as they contrast and compare frameworks and so forth. It's like, dude, in 2003, do you know how much fucking RAM cost and CPUs and how complicated it was and how slow Ruby was at the time and how slow Rails was at the time? Like, we've moved another 13 years on from that where cost has just plummeted and performance actually of Ruby and Rails have skyrocketed in many ways. And what has uh, what has gone up? Um, cost of programmers, right? That is the one variable that matters. Like uh, if I look at the spend that we have at Basecamp on uh, programmers and salaries and benefits and fucking healthcare, do you think I give a shit what an extra uh, $10,000 of RAM costs for a Memcache server? I just don't yeah, because I, it's just a rounding error. We have another question, well, statement really in the chat um, uh, about, I'm just going to read it. The point of nanosecond response times is not end user experience from a request. It's for machine density and handling thousands of requests per yes. second. Yes, but I think you would say, well, I mean, our, you know, our server costs of, you know, if we if all of Basecamp servers could run in nanoseconds, it would it would be, you know, not rounding error to the business. Seriously, you know? yes. I mean, literally. If let's say let's put a thought experiment in here. Let's just say that to go from 100 milliseconds to one nanoseconds, uh, I would have to hire 50 percent more staff to deal with a 50 percent less productive environment. Would I make that trade? Absolutely not. Would I do it at 20 percent? Absolutely not. Would I do it at 2%? Maybe. Like, I'm not against performance for free. I love performance for free. The things I'm willing to trade for it, certainly not Ruby. <laughs> From my dead cold hands. Um, certainly not Rails. Certainly not the productivity we get out of building systems in this way. And again, that comes to the fact that uh, Basecamp 3 right now is what? 25,000 lines of code. Like, if I was building an app that was five screens, or something like like WhatsApp or whatever, right? Where the complexity of the app itself is very low, as in it has low number of functional points. It's a different story. It's a different scenario. If you're writing like 500 lines of code, like yeah, okay, you don't really care if like okay, I can get from 100 milliseconds to one nanoseconds if I write like a thousand lines of code. Fine, sign me up, right? If I have to go from 25,000 lines of code to 75,000 lines of code, there's you, you're not gonna get me kicking and screaming into that um, that argument, which comes back to the whole notion of what does machine density even mean? Well, it could mean lower cost of operation because you need less machines. It could mean maybe you're doing it for environmental reasons, like, hey, it's better to save some money on electricity. Well, unless you're already fucking remote working out in the woods somewhere and, and never using an automobile, like mm, maybe that's not the one that tips the scale on a, on a global level, right? So put these aspirations in context and do they matter in the context? And that's the part that I often see people just go like off to la la land, right? Where you just go like, yes, in isolation, if you just looked at that one thing, that one thing might matter. When you put it into the perspective of everything, it doesn't matter at all. Um, and I think that is probably the most important lesson that I've taken away both from business and software development is to contextualize things and prioritize the individual elements against that whole thing. Like, where do I spend my time? Okay, I could spend my time on this one thing. Does this one thing matter in the grand scheme of things? Okay, no, it doesn't. Well, I shouldn't spend my time there. Um, and that goes for resources, it goes for people, it goes for all sorts of other things, right? And it goes for joy and happiness and whatever, right? Like how much money would I pay? Um, or I put it another way, how much more money would I have to make for, and I'm putting a caricature up here, but just for sake of argument, to switch from Ruby to Java, where I had to write Java every day? Like, I was actually kind of thinking, like, is there actually even a number? Could you pay me, like, 100 million, and then I'd have to write Java for 10 years? I don't think you could. Like, seriously, I don't mean that in a – that's not even a sake of argument. Like, literally, if you showed up and said, hey, dude, you got to program Java for six hours a day, and you can't use any under transpilers. It's got to be, like, vanilla full-on Java or even Java 8, um, and I'm going to pay you 100 million. 
over 10 years. I'd probably say, eh, go, go to do something else. Go do something else. Well, that's interesting because that, that sort of gets at a question I, I wanted to ask, which is uh, I think in – if you just look at the Rails core team and look at how they've churned over time, I think a lot of programmers um, just – uh, end up moving to other languages over you know the course of their career, right? It's not, I guess, it's not that extreme. But I think a lot of people maybe that are just getting into Rails, and this is part of why I wrote this whole you know course, was uh, they have a lot of like anxiety about like, well, is Rails fast enough compared to Rust, Ecto, you know, JavaScript, flavor of the week language, or whatever? Um, what stops has stopped you from having that feeling? Because clearly, it sounds like you're going to write Ruby until you know you're in the grave. Uh, so, what? Not necessarily. First of all, but um, I will write Ruby until the day that a prettier, nicer, better feeling language comes along. Which, I mean, until my grave, that's a pretty long time span. I seriously hope we come <laughs> up with something better than Ruby over the next eighty years. Otherwise, that says something. <laughs> Thing or two, I think about uh, either the brilliance of Matt's or just our uh, uh, incapability of moving the needle forward. Um, but I think your point, like the anxiety. What stops my anxiety? The real fucking world. Like I just deploy code and I see, oh, it totally serves its purpose within a very reasonable budget, and I have absolutely zero problems with it. Wonderful. Let's go ahead. Which is why I'm kind of passionate about spreading this is because Basecamp is already so much larger than the vast, vast majority of apps getting deployed in this world. The number of um, users and customers that we have to deal with, um, like we're, we're in the below the 1%, right? For sure. Um, and when that's so imminently feasible, like the 99 just shouldn't freak the fuck out. Like I'm sitting here in the 1% saying, Guys, it's 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 gonna be fine. Again, within this definition of fine that I've set up with my disclaimers here, um, like the 99 just doesn't have to worry. And secondly, I've heard these worries for fucking 15 years. They weren't true 15 years ago when everything was 10x as expensive and 10x as slow. They're not true now. Again, for the vast majority of people in the vast majority of cases. Um, so it's just it's one of those things where you just go like. I, that's probably just human psychology. Like that's what we do. We freak the fuck out about things that just end up not mattering. Look at all sorts of other things in this world, right? Like people are like, holy shit, terrorists, and then they down a fucking twelve hundred calorie hamburger with extra bacon and fries and so on. Like, right? Like, oh, those terrorists, they're gonna get me someday, right? Like, versus the what? 100,000 people or more that die of heart disease every day, or then they fucking dare cross the street in a city. Do you know how many fucking people die in Chicago alone from crossing the street? I think it was something like 1,000 people died in road accidents, right? And in the US alone, it's 35,000, or 30, yeah, 35,000 people a year die from road accidents, right? So you go like, mm, in this context of mortality, am I likely to be killed by an AK-47 wielding, ISIS warrior. Nope, I am not. In the context of programming and in the context of performance, is my startup going to die because I write it in Ruby and Rails and it's too slow? Nope, it is not. So again, not meaning, yes, there is a 0 0.0001% chance, chance that that is true. And if that happens to you, I'm sorry. But chances are that it won't. So. Live your life, conduct your business, whether um, it's fearing how you're going to die or whether your app is fast enough based on probabilities and odds and likely things to happen. Um, and just start worrying about the bomb. So uh, to go back to something we were talking about earlier, uh, I thought this was a good question. Uh, it's from the chat, Dylan Welch. Um, uh, you were talking about setting up uh, your Russian doll caching so that you're kind of deliberately n plus one in yourself, but you know, that never actually happens. Um, how do you avoid in, you know, scenarios where you have to grab three, four, five, a dozen, uh, queries, avoiding having to do the same end trips back and forth between, uh, the yourself and the cache server? 
not 100% sure I understand that. Like the well, thing you know, like, like if, if, uh, if you go back to your, your, your email and inbox example, right? Yep. So yep. How do I avoid going back to my cache 50 times to grab each, you know, uh, ah, yes, yes, drag yes. back and yes. forth? Yes. Great uh, question and something we had to solve and solved relatively recently. Caches now have this wonderful thing called multi get. So you can do uh, uh, multi-gets on collections um, and then get what you need in a single cache query rather than, because I mean, even if you are fet fetching things from cache and even if the cache is local, you're right that you can N plus self, N plus one yourself on the cache, not on the, um, on the collection. And we put a bunch of work, uh, I'm not sure when this hit, I think Rails 5 so for sure has all of it, has a, a full, um, multi-get automatic uh, collection fetching when you do render collection cache true. When you do that, it's going to spin through the, um, the collection and, and look up the caches and, and get them that way. But, and, and also in some cases it just isn't possible. Like some pages will trigger, I don't know, 15 cache calls. Right, I mean, sometimes you're because not certain grabbing... things expired and so on, right? Yeah. Like that's usually how it happens is, well, it's easy once you have the whole Russian doll set up and, and nothing changes, the next person who requests it can get the whole doll in a single request, right? But if something did change between then and there, you still will expire something, so you still will have to recompute some of the things. It's just that it just, it's pretty fast, right? Like you can do yeah. most of your calls through to Redis or whatever in, in, a, in a millisecond or less. But still, it is a millisecond or thereabout. So if you, if you do 150 of them, you still go up to 150 milliseconds. So you, you gotta pay attention to that. But there are all these strategies around multi-get and so on that you can use to avoid the vast majority of it. It just, after that, it's not a problem. Uh, just to stay on Russian doll caching for a second, uh, I think a, a question that a lot of people come to me with when they're starting out with key-based expiration and, and Russian doll caching is uh, they come and they've got these, uh, you know, cache do calls that have these enormous keys of like five oh, yeah. models in a row, right? So. Do you have those problems, and how do you solve them? I mean, what, how do you avoid having these ultra complicated cache keys? Yes, I am. I'm pretty militant about having uh, one cache, one key. So, let, just like the Russian doll kind of flows its cache up and down, do so too with expiration, and that is usually around triggering the hierarchy expiration, right? You do touch. So, if you go all the way down, you have one comment belongs to a message, and it touches. So, when you add a comment it'll touch the message, and when the message is touched, it'll touch the project, let's say, and, and thereby you have a three, three layer, right? So if you add a comment, it'll expire the project. So you can make a bunch of things depend on just the project if, for example, the project page can depend just on the project, not on the things that are in the project because you've already set it up such that the project is being touched whenever something inside of it is being, um, created or rendered or whatever. And same with the message too, right? Like one new comment is added, message is touched, thus the whole message page can depend just on the on the comment. But that being said, there are still lots of cases where, for example, on a page you might have personalized info of some kind or things that are time expiration and so on. And this is where JavaScript sprinkles are wonderful. So you take this approach that what goes in the cache is this idealized form that is suitable for everyone. And then you put in um, replacement keys, essentially, like current user, um, that you then replace through JavaScript. And sometimes we even do it on more sophisticated things than just current user. We can do it on like a certain setting. Like this page is being cached on, um, on some display, right? And we then fetch things, sometimes even multiple HTTP calls after the fact, because we know those calls are cheap. Like one example is on um, on a message page in Basecamp, we have a little button that says whether you're following this page or not. Th that Boolean is user dependent, but we don't want to make the whole cache user dependent. That kind of defeats the purpose, right? And we certainly as hell don't want to make the cache depend on both the message and that Boolean. That's disproportionate. So what we do instead is we render basically a dummy button. But dummy follow button that has a JavaScript sprinkle on it that makes it do an extra HTTP call to check just the status of that. And that sounds horribly inefficient, but it really isn't because you're breaking down your pages in such a way that they're all really cheap and simple to render and 
again, right? So you can either do it with preloading. You can also do it with shoving things into the head, for example. Yeah, I, um, I noticed in your the body, and then you have things right. in the head that that's per user. Right. There's I, a lot I of strategies. In the one of the things you guys seem to do on Basecamp is uh, there's a I think it's a meta tag that has like the yes. user's like name and their like initials, exactly. which I think probably is, yep. is just getting JavaScripted in yep. somewhere else. Yes, exactly. That's that's really what it is for. That did you try to make these broad templates that work for as many people as possible and in many situations as possible and depend on as on as few keys as possible, and then you your outlet is that you JavaScript replace the rest. Um, so we've been kind of talking about performance means and median times here, but I think you know you said publicly in the past that. Focusing on obviously just the means is going to give you an incomplete picture of the yes. performance in your application. Why is looking at 95th percentile, even 99.9, .9, you know, two nines of, of percentile times um, so important? I think and it's, what, it's what important. Are some, what are some examples of like things where you've, you've like went looking for dragons in the 95th, 99th percentile? Like what, what are the kind of problems that Basecamp has and you've dug, you've dug out and like, oh, 1% of people are having such and such an experience. Yep. Um, so that's exactly what uh, the reason why you need to go looking there. Because like, oh, looking at the 99th, it's not that many. Well, if you actually have like a million people using your um, application on a daily basis, 1% is still uh, a lot of people, right? Like, what is that? 1,000 people or something? That's my head math that usually goes wrong. It's a lot of people, right? And they get that experience. And if, if, if it feels wrong for them, it still feels wrong for them. Um, so, so we go chase dragons there, and, and oftentimes we do it for other selfish reasons. For example, um, one of the dragons we just went tracing recently was that posting a um, message in Campfire was taking a little bit of a longer time. When you post a message, well, not Campfire, Campfire is the name for chat in, in Basecamp 3. When you post a message in the Basecamp 3 chat, it goes through a uh, job system, right? Like you put it into a job queue because it needs to do a bunch of work. When you post a new message, it needs to update the message room, but it also needs to relay that message to other people who are not currently in the room. It needs to update unread counters. It needs to update the general cache of the whole uh, project page. It needs to do actually a, a large amount of work, comparatively speaking, right? That amount of work can take uh, actually a couple hundred milliseconds, I think. I think we're like 200 or 250 or something. And that is, a, that is one case where you type something, you hit return, you don't want to feel that delay. In that case, 300 milliseconds actually can feel like a problem, right? Once you get back down to the 100 or something, it, it, it doesn't feel like a problem anymore. Anyway, so to do this, we shoved the work into a job queue. And what we were finding was that sometimes these queue depths were spiking. And we were like, why the hell are they spiking? And we looked into some of these jobs were taking like 40 seconds. And we went like, what? How is this taking 40 seconds for someone to say something and then hear something back? Oh, well, in that room, there were like 2,500 people. And we were like, oh, shit. I didn't design it at all for that. We designed it for like 100 people or less at the most, and in the vast majority of cases, more like 50 people, right? So the amount of work that we were doing, we were doing it in a serialized bunch. And if you're doing that like one use at a time, like, hey, let me update his unread counter. Let me send it by email to him if he's not online. Let me ping his mobile phone if he needs a push notification. All, the, all that work, we were doing that one at a time. And if you're doing that for 2,500 people, well, surprise, surprise, it takes 40 seconds, <laughs> at least in our setup. So to support 2,500 people, either we should just serialize or not serialize, uh, paralyze it such that we're doing the the job work in, in bulks, like for example, there's one job per 100 people, such that each individual job only takes 400 milliseconds or whatever it is. Um, and then it's, it's going to work out fine. But anyway, that was an example where, where a dragon popped up that actually was causing problems for other people. And that's sometimes what happens with these dragons is it, it's not just the person themselves who get to see the problem. It, the problem can spill over when you've designed your system in such a way that um, it relies on fast responses. Another example of this is if you have an unsophisticated setup with your application servers where you have queuing happening at the individual app workers um, and not a centralized distribution point, you could have, like, let's say, uh, an app worker that has a, a queue that's 5D. So if number five has to wait for number one, two, three to complete really long, slow requests, well, their experience is going to feel 
pretty crap. I'd say that's an anti-pattern, but I mean, what you should do is, is you shouldn't send people to workers and tell the workers free. But some setups, and we've had this setup in the past, um, that wasn't true. We were queuing low numbers at each individual workers, right? We were like, hey, there's three queued at this worker. That's not a problem. Well, it is a problem if this request takes two seconds because now the other two people waiting in line are going to get their request time plus the two seconds to complete. So, um, And it's also just a good way to find out more often than not, it's not so much even just the performance. It is that your UI was not designed for this case. So sometimes when we see uh, pages that take a very long time to render, it's because we didn't, for example, design the page to have 2,500 people on it. It's not infinity scrolled or it's not uh, partially loaded or whatever. It simply tries to show 2,500 avatars or something in like a little dialog box. Well. Not helpful, right? Like it breaks, even if we could do it fast, it's still a poor user experience because the system was not designed as that. So in many cases, these dragons are simply pointers to edge cases that you did not design the system for. Um, and you should go investigate those. Whether you can make them fast enough is often irrelevant because the real answer in most cases is you have to redesign them. So we're coming up you know, lurching towards the Rails 5 release now. As of this recording, I think we're on beta 4, beta 5. Um, yep. So let's talk about the, I guess we got to talk about Action Cable, right? Like that's one of, that's going to be the thing that everyone talks about when Rails 5, you know, yep. people write yep. that Rails 5 blog post. So, uh, you know, maybe just explain really briefly what that feature is, but I, I'd really like to talk about the performance story behind Action Cable yep. because I know... Basecamp with Campfire has been like a huge, you know, long polling shop for like the last yep. 10 years. Yep. Like you were, let's do long right. polling. And like now yep. it's like WebSocket. So that's like a really interesting uh, swap. And like, let's yes. talk about the performance story there. Sure. So Action Cable is a way of making it feel as fun and productive to write WebSockets features as it is to write the rest of your Rails application. Make it basically no more complicated to add WebSockets to your app than it is to add another controller. And allow you to reuse your entire domain model, all your active records and other Ruby uh, models inside the WebSockets work um, and still have it happen in a performant good way. So the performance story there is, is, is twofold. One is, um, Action Cable now requires persistent connections, right? So that's the whole thing about WebSockets. It creates a persistent connection, and that's part of why it's fast, because it's not doing handshaking every time. It's not uh, exchanging ciphers, blah, blah, blah. There's no SSL. And also, there's no headers and so on. It's a pretty efficient format, right? So you can shoot things quickly back and forth. But the price you pay is one performance to complexity of, of maintaining these long-running open connections back and forth. Well. There is one performance there is like, how many of those can you keep? Like, how many open connections can you keep? And how much hardware do you need to, uh, to keep it with? And it turned out, first, that was one of the things we stressed about. Like, oh, shit, how many connections can we have? And then as we started doing our testing, we found out, like, uh, not relevant, not the bottleneck. We can keep plenty and plenty and plenty of open connections. The bottleneck is the work. So. It is when you actually try to do something. Just opening a connection and having someone say nothing on that connection, well, surprise, that doesn't take that much. Now, there are plenty of other frameworks. Um, uh, Erlang, for example, is, is very good at this stuff, right? Like, let's open 2 million connections on a single box. And I say, well, what would you do? Can you make those 2 million people actually do anything interesting on that same box? And if not, mm, how, much, how helpful is that? Probably not that helpful, right? Like, if each of these 2 million people just have to perform a task that takes, let's say, again, 100 milliseconds, right? 2 million times 100 milliseconds, that's a lot of actual seconds or minutes or hours, <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Uh, now, you can do other things. You can have, like, a single box, then shove things into a, a queue of some kind, and then it's the queue that does the work and so forth. But still, the work needs to be done. And I think that that's the part of the WebSockets performance discussion that I feel is missed in much the same ways as Hello World is heralded as something that matters. Oh, well, my the overhead of my framework is, who cares? Like, if the work you have to do is, let's say, standard 100 milliseconds, and the overhead of Rails on a single Hello World is, like, 2 milliseconds, 
it doesn't matter. You're doing 100 milliseconds worth of work. What do you care if the overhead is two milliseconds or it's two nanoseconds? It's just irrelevant. And I think the same is true largely for WebSockets work. If you're doing actual real work, is that the overhead of keeping the connections open is so small compared to the doing the actual work. And if you say, so what is the work? Let's take um, the chat example again, right? Someone chatting. They either send a message or they receive a message. And in both, ca both cases, there's a lot of work involved, at least on our application, because we do a lot of stuff. We don't just echo it straight out on a raw socket or something, right? Like we need to record it in the database. We need to update caches. We need to ping mobile applications. We need to send out emails. We need to do lots and lots of work. And what turned out for us was that that was the bottleneck, doing all the work and setting it up in such a way that we had enough job servers to do part of the work, and we would do some of the work on the application servers themselves. But that story, at least, is quite familiar because it's the same story you use for scaling a normal web application. Um, it, because on a normal web application, if you could just cache everything, in, as in if there's no actual work, if you're just pulling something out of Redis and sending it straight down the HTTP pipe, well, you can do a lot of that, right? How relevant is that? How much of your application's time is going to be spent doing that? Not a lot. What is more relevant is when someone posts a comment, well, you have to update the database. You have to send the email. You've got to do all the work. And the overhead, um, in many cases, just doesn't matter. Like if, is, if the workload is even minor, overhead is irrelevant. Overhead is generally only relevant when you're basically doing no work. When, you're doing, when are you doing no work? Well, you're doing no work when you're just trying to demonstrate how many people can connect to something or how many times you can say hello world. Are either of those experiments relevant for the kind of work that I do for Basecamp? Absolutely not. They tell me nothing. They don't tell me anything about how this is going to help me. Um, so I think what most people are going to find is there, there's two factors of this. One is if you truly just you have some public app of some kind where like you have the 2 million connections and like 2 million is a real number. You need to support that. And like they're not doing individual work back, but they just need to get some sort of update. Like maybe there's some counter changes and you can send that out in a very efficient way or whatever. Maybe that's a use case where that's helpful. For none of the work that I do, is that true? Um, for all the work that I do, like people are actually doing work and getting real updates, right? Like, um, and it's happening in small enough bunches that like, Someone updating something in one project at Basecamp is not going to be broadcasted to 2 million people. It's going to be broadcasted to like 15. And then there's like hundreds, if not thousands, of other people doing exactly the same thing, doing a piece of work that then needs to be broadcasted to like somewhere between 2 and 25 people or something. And then again, the onus is back on doing the work, that the work is the bottleneck, not the connection overhead. So again, it depends on your app, it depends on public, blah, 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 blah. Um, I posit again that Basecamp is an archetype app for a lot of people and that it's more similar and more like to most people's apps than connecting, let's say, 2 million people to some public server and sending out some sort of update. So then let's talk about the other uh, big marquee feature, the one I'm particularly excited about, which is Turbolinks 5. Um, yes. Yeah. So what... I, th I think, could you just comment briefly on kind of like what happened for people like me that sort of follow, you know, Turbolinks development? I think we kind of all got confused when I was like, oh, it's, no, Turbolinks 3 is coming. Uh, it's not coming anymore. And, yep. and so yep. just can you comment on what happened there and uh, sure. why, why Turbolinks was completely rewritten? Yes. So Turbolinks 3 was basically the master branch of the Turbolinks that we shipped um, the early version of Basecamp with, Basecamp 2. Uh, so for Basecamp 2, we were just focused on, on, on doing the desktop web version of Basecamp over Turbolinks. We weren't using Turbolinks on the mobile or anything else like that. Um, and we were collaborating with uh, Shopify on that because they were using it in similar ways. And we started exploring a, a bunch of things like uh, partial updates and um, more importantly, at least for me, was the uh, notion of permanence that certain uh, elements of a page of a DOM could be permanent between page changes. So, so you could have things like a persistent menu bar at the top, which, surprise, surprise, is exactly what uh, Basecamp 3 uses. It has a, a Turbolinks permanent uh, menu header, so that that doesn't change and it can keep its, its 
DOM-based counters and things like that between page requests. Anyway, so we start working, doing all this work, and then uh, during this development, which was sort of stretched out over a long period of time, and, and for whatever reason, never ended up finalizing shipping because of a variety of problems and complications with partial updates, we started working on the new version of Basecamp. And for the new version of Basecamp, we got more ambitious in the ways we wanted to use Turbolinks. Basically, we wanted to have a majestic monolith that not only powered the desktop web, but also powered our native apps to an even greater extent than what was true in, in BCX or BC2, Basecamp 2. Uh, in Basecamp 2, we had native optimized views. So we had like a whole, they were using, we were using the same controllers, but the um, native or, or mobile was getting its own views written from scratch with its own JavaScript and its own CSS, so that we could hand tune it to be very quick, right? Well, things changed between 2012 and 2016, and mobile devices got a ton faster. In, was, they got so much faster that it was far more feasible to reuse the same body of JavaScript and CSS across both mobile and desktop. And once that happened, we went, well, hallelujah. Now I don't have to write my feature twice in terms of views, right? So we can just use the same complete views with some CSS nipping and tucking across the different uh, platforms. That's amazing. Well, it's not that amazing if you can't use Turbolinks on your mobile platform. Um, and you could use Turbolinks if you're just doing mobile web, but we also wanted to do native apps. And what we found was trying to use Turbolinks 3 with native wrappers uh, was not up to the quality that we needed. And there's a bunch of complications for why that is. Uh, some, a simple way to explain it is, for example, in, in iOS, um, you can slide back in your history. Like if you do this halfway, you see the current screen you're on, and then you see the history screen you have behind it. To make that work, it's actually surprisingly complicated um, in a native app. And we tried all sorts of things with two buffers and da 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 da. And we wanted to wrap all this up in a way so that we had a framework that could take care of it, so that Turbo Links could interact with a native app and native wrapper in such a way that you could not tell what was native and what was web. And that required a lot of concessions to the uh, life cycle mode of changing pages and so on between iOS and Android. Um, so that was the reason we ended up rewriting Turbolinks. We rewrote Turbolinks specifically such that it would be suitable for embedding in native applications on iOS and Android. And also, let's also be fair here, because Turbolinks was a bit, bit of a mess. When I originally wrote the first version of Turbolinks, it was, I think, like 90 lines that fitted on a single page of JavaScript. And by the time 3.0 was done, like it was 600 lines of garbled googly goo. Um, and there were like two people who fully understood how that worked. So that was another positive side effect that we just got to basically take the full evolution of Turbolinks up until that point and say, OK, we learned a bunch of stuff. Now let's, that was the demo, and then let's rewrite the, the full thing. Um, but I mean, the more important driver was let's embed it into uh, native applications. And that then led to us making full native frameworks, something we've never done before. We released a Turbolinks 5 framework for iOS, a Turbolinks 5 framework for Android, fully set up for people who want to follow this model of a majestic monolith at the center uh, that powers native applications. Yeah, and, and so now you're, you have Basecamp native apps for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and then I guess you can count the web, right? So that's five yep. platforms yep. with how many yes. programmers? Exactly, right? Like we have, uh, what, are people working on new features, like uh, six people on the web and then four across all the mobile apps, right? So 10 people is working on features like that. That is just not possible if you do not go majestic. Yeah, and by ridiculous. majestic, I mean monolith, right? You need much larger teams if you're going to do full native applications, at least if your app is anywhere near the scale of what Basecamp is, right? Um, which, I mean, let's also be fair here. Basecamp is a very large app. Uh, it has in excess of 200 separate screens. Can you imagine making 200 native screens? Like, I can't imagine that. Uh, and I can't even imagine how large the team would be, how long it would take, right? Like, if everything in Basecamp got sent down by JSON and then it had to be implemented into a native, I mean, 
it would take eons and we would have to have a company that was like five times as large. And we didn't want any of those things. And I think that that is, that is the true promise and the real reason why I'm so damn passionate about Turbolinks in spite and in face of lots of criticism, oh, it doesn't work with this plugin or it makes things complicated or it's not client side MSC or it's not blah, 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 blah. Well, whatever the fuck, listen, this is what this allows us to do. I mean, it's magic technology. I'd say of all the things that we put into Rails and I otherwise use, Turbolinks may very well be the most important productive tool that we have that enabled Basecamp 3 to roll out across as many platforms. Because if the alternatives really were between that and either rewriting the entire app tw at least twice for like some sort of hand-tuned, mobile optimized HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or do everything with full client side, native client side implementations, we just, we, it wouldn't be possible. Yeah. I mean, it simply enabled things that would not be possible before, which I can't say that about a whole lot of other things. Yeah. I, so, I, uh, I think the, the, especially when Turbolinks originally came out, it got sort of slept on by, uh, small to medium sized companies or sort of freelancer developers because I don't know if it's just like it's just not uh, interesting enough like I don't know how long Turbolinx 5 is now in terms of like lines of coffee script but it's an extremely simple easy to understand yes. library like if you understand document dot body equals XHR dot right. body inside right. of the XHR object. Like that's Turbolinks. Yeah. Like the rest is just, you know, yes. fluff, yes. right? Like that's it. Yes. yes. Uh, it's not yes. like, oh, we have different components and the components have state and props and we're going to like re render the world, right. man. Like it's not, right. it's just not interesting to. And I think that was part of the problem and, and part of perhaps unrealistic expectations. Because Turbolinks was so simple, people assumed, and I'll take some of the blame, we perhaps oversold it as like it's a drop-in replacement that requires no modifications of any kind mm. to your app. And that was never going to be true, right? True. Yeah. Like all the Java, uh, jQuery plugins of the world generally are written in the, let's throw away the entire process on each page change. And we hook in in all sorts of life cycles and things to make that true. And with Turbolinks, you're switching from a CGI model to a... Uh, a persistent process model. And I actually remember when we did that for Rails. Rails started out being CGI. So for the people who used Rails back in 2004, early 2004, there was no fast CGI. There was no persistent process because the whole thing was so small, we were actually recalculating the entire thing on each page request. God, right? that's a that, quickly, to about. that quickly turned out not to be tenable, right? For all the reasons why we have persistent processes. Um, just that we don't have to recompile the same thing on every request, right? That's freaking retarded. In some ways, and in other ways, it's not retarded, right? That's still PHP. <laughs> so PHP still works like this and, well, it can also run persistent process, but a lot of its um, approachability comes from the fact that it doesn't run a persistent process. I, it is seen much you, easier to I, throw out a process every time. I've seen you mention in the past how much you respect actually how PHP Absolutely. was originally like, let's drop it in the, in the markup and, like, and how yes. simple that is for people to understand. And a big part of that simplicity came as well from the CGI model, from the non-persistent model of execution, right? You could do all sorts of crazy ass things that would have leaked like a thousand gigabytes in 200 requests, but it didn't because it was thrown out every time. And that was exactly the change that would happen with Turbolinks. People used to a CGI model being forced to reconcile with a persistent process model, yeah. which it's funny because there's another parallel to this, which is uh, Spring, which is the uh, um, accelerator we use for, for Rails. And it's going through that same reactionary process like, oh shit, now it's a persistent process. And that has some drawbacks and has some added complexity or complexity. But that is a price very well paid when it enables you to do all sorts of other wonderful things. Yeah, for people that um, maybe don't follow me on Twitter, if you look at the top five Rails mm -hmm. apps uh, in the world by size, you know, Basecamp, Shopify, Cookpad, um, GitHub, they are all using some form of a Turbolinks like solution. Some of them use Turbolinks right out of the box, like Cookpad does. Um, so, uh, as far as I know, every Rails site at scale uses a solution similar. Um, Unless, I mean, to, also to fair enough. If, if you use full on client side MVC and you're just using Rails to send down JSON, I mean, it's a different story. And you can do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great too. Like, that's not what I enjoy doing for most of the work that I do. but. It's a completely valid uh, 
uh, mode of operation as well, right? So we're out of time here, but I want to end on one final question from the chat because um, I was going to ask the same thing. Uh, as far as you can share, um, what does kind of like the gem file of Basecamp 3 look like today? The specific question here was what background processing are you using? Um, so sneakers, sidekick, whatever. Really? I'd like to really? know what app server you're using, um, Puma, yep. Passenger, whatever. What, what does that kind of gem file look like? Yep, we use uh, Unicorn for um, the regular web views. We use Puma for the cable, action cable servers. We've split those two things out. The new default in Rails 5 is Puma, so that you can run everything in one process. <laughs> um, you can use Passenger for that as well. But anyway, we use Unicorn on just the website, Puma on the cable side. We use Rescue for job processing. Um, Let's see, is there anything else that's interesting? Our file isn't that long. Like, perhaps that's also why we don't use a lot of like plugins in the sense of like device or something else that perhaps a lot of people use. Um, we used to use a lot of testing plugins. There's no R spec hidden in there or something else like that. <laughs> um, so we have some in internal tool <laughs> that we use for our own stuff, but um, let me actually just go in right now and see if uh, I can find anything else that, that, that seems juicy. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah, some secret RSpec plugins you don't tell anyone about. That you right. <laughs> I'm just trying to think if there's any. I mean, we use a lot of So around Rescue, we have a bunch of things like the dynamic queues, multi-job forks, pool, the scheduler. Um, what else do we use? Of our own storage, we have uh, our own storage solution. And then we also use uh, S3. Uh, let's see. We have a bunch of things for some instrumentation. Uh, for going back to our own uh, uh, data warehouse kind of setup. Um, now we just tried out uh, Sentry, actually. Oh, I am the opening. maintainer of the Ruby client, so let me know if you have any oh, problems. Really? Well, <laughs> yeah. um, we just switched to that recently. We had our own homegrown solution for that, and we just thought, like, hey, why, why are we doing that? Don't need to do that anymore. Um, oh. We just started uh, Skylight for some stuff as well. Um, let's see what else. I think that's pretty much it. Like, it's just, it's not that interesting. Like, the whole file is 168 lines. Cool. And that's with a bunch of comments mm. and, and things split out. So, I mean, that's also, I, I, of course, that's what's going to be true, right? Like, because the Rails default stack is like the base camp stack <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. a large extent. So, we get to rely on all the defaults because we already picked those out and that's why we wanted them. So, there are no substitutions, right? <laughs> like, if something in, in the Rails stack doesn't work for Basecamp, chances are it's not going to be in the Rails stack for that long. Simply be because like, I get to say what's, what's in it. <laughs> and if I didn't like it, why would it be in it, right? And if I did like it, why wouldn't it be in it? So yeah, that that's a little bit of a cheat, perhaps, that uh, is not <laughs> accessible to, to everyone. And not everyone has their own 10-year-old web framework. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it helps. <laughs> so that's time. Thank you so much for doing this. I had a lot of fun. Sure. Um, and uh, for everyone watching, uh, this is going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on my YouTube channel. This, that's why I do Hangouts on Air, because this like, automatically gets recorded and put up. So um, all you can watch this again if you missed part of it or um, you know, show it to your coworkers or whatever. So um, thanks again, David. My pleasure. All right, man. Take care.